Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Samantha Barrett, and I'm the Assistant Director of Regional Alumni Engagement for the Southeast U.S. I thank you all for being with us today and hope that you are all healthy and safe. This webinar is part of the Rutgers University Alumni Association's virtual event series, which offers Rutgers alumni and friends the opportunity to stay connected and hear from faculty members across the university. Today, we have Dr. Mark Gregory Robson, Board of Governors Distinguished Service Professor at Rutgers School of Environmental and Biological Sciences in the Department of Plant Biology. Just a bit of housekeeping before we begin, all attendees have been placed on mute for the duration of this discussion. If you have questions, please send them via the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any time throughout the presentation. Following the discussion, I will read your questions aloud to Jean. Um, we will get to as many as possible. It is now my privilege to turn it over to Dr. Robson. Well, thank you so much. And what a joy it is to introduce my friend of almost 50 years, Jean McAvoy. Uh, Jean and I were privileged to be part of the Hellyer House Cooperative Living Group back in the 1970s. And today we're honored to welcome Jean back home to Rutgers. Although virtually, we're still very glad. Jean has been a leader and a force in horticultural production globally. Uh, as he likes to say, he got his start working on a farm to raise money for his college. And that has led to him becoming a global leader and advocate for farming, for farmers, and for the general public. Jean worked under two giants at Rutgers, Dr. George Taylor and Dr. Bernard Pollock. And from his work with Dr. Pollock, he found his first assignment to be in the Peace Corps in Niger. And as a result of that time in Africa, Gene spent about 14 years in West Africa, South Africa, and the Caribbean before he joined the University of Florida. He is currently the Associate Director of Stakeholder Relations at the University of Florida's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. Gene has served uh, and is a specialized vegetable horticultural agent at Southwest Florida for about 23 years, covering a five county area. Gene's gotten lots of recognition. In fact, a couple of years ago, I was saying to the Rutgers alumni team, I was sitting in an airport in Minneapolis, and who pops up on CNN but my friend Gene McAvoy talking about the current crop condition in Florida? Gene is a global leader and a rock star. And while he's gotten many accolades, locally, nationally, and internationally, the one I'm most proud of in receiving is the Cook PAS Alumni Award of the Dennis Fenton Award for Graduate Education. She's a scientist, a leader, an advocate, a friend, and an incredibly decent person. It is my privilege to introduce to you my friend, Gene McAvoy. Thank you very much, Mark, for the kind introduction and Thanks, Sam and Brian, for inviting me to speak with you tonight. I'm going to just pull up my screen. And tonight I'll be talking about gardening with natives, native plants for birds and butterflies here in Florida. And basically, what are natives? Natives, since Florida was underwater for most of its geological history, all the plants that are here came from somewhere, but we consider native or indigenous plants that were those that were here before the arrival of Europeans in the new world. And why do we wanna plant natives? Or why do we wanna talk about natives? It's hard to argue with mother nature. These plants have been tested over time. They are basically, you know, have proven themselves or been subjected to, you know, a lot of environmental pressures and survival of the fittest has ruled. They've evolved over eons and are adapted to our local conditions. They're adapted to local soils and weather conditions. They possess natural resistance to many pests and diseases. And what is also germane to our discussion today. They make up natural communities that provide food and shelter for wildlife. So if we want to encourage butterflies and birds in our um, gardens, native plants are something that will contribute to making that happen. They can be very attractive on both rural and urban landscapes. 
they're beautiful, they're hardy, they're drought resistant, and they're low maintenance. All of it, all of while, all of which while benefiting the environment. They can save you time and money because they will eliminate or reduce the need for fertilizer, pesticides, water, and lawn maintenance equipment. If you, and especially here in Florida, we have a lot of environmental issues. Um, you know, you don't have to be from Florida to know that we've had intensive algal blooms along both coasts the past few years. And one of the reasons for this is excessive amounts of nutrients getting into our waterways. And we do, in a conventional landscape, apply vast amounts of fertilizers to those landscapes. And those nutrients can get into our water, spurring excessive algal growth, causing oxygen depletion, which harms aquatic life and interferes with our recreational pursuits. Native plants are also more pest and disease or more resistant to pest and diseases because they've evolved under exposure to these organisms. In addition, non-native plants, especially here in Florida with our year-round warm temperatures and subtropical environment, often become pests and or what we like to call or call invasive weeds. It's estimated that over 70 million pounds of pesticides are applied to lawns each year. And these pesticides can also run into water bodies, rivers and lakes and groundwater increasing our risk of exposure. So we can reduce pesticide usage. Native plants also use less water. Lawn irrigation uses between 30 to 50% of the water consumption in residential areas. So by switching to natives, we can reduce the amount of water that we use. And again, here in Florida, this is becoming more and more critical. Our population is increasing exponentially. And in some areas of the state, especially in the Tampa area, we are actually in danger of running out of water in a place that you know, it was once a big wetland. Natives can also reduce runoff and favor aquifer recharge, and they're adapted to extreme hydrological or the extreme hydrological or the hydrological extremes. You know, we have a wet season and a dry season. It can be extremely wet in the summer and extremely dry in the winter, and natives are adapted to this regimen. They can help reduce air pollution. By using natives, you're going to reduce the amount of mowing, allowing you more time for recreational opportunities. It's estimated that gas powered garden tools emit 5% of the nation's air pollution. 40 million lawnmowers countrywide consume 200 million gallons of gasoline each year. And in addition, native plants can help sequester carbon. Um, contributing to the solution of climate change. Native plants also benefit wildlife by increasing habitat diversity and can help us attract a variety of butterflies, birds and other wildlife by providing food sources. And if you think about it, closely mowed lawns are very little use to most wildlife. Natives can also save money. Over a 20 year period, the cumulative cost of maintaining a prairie type habitat or a wetland type habitat is about $3,000 per acre versus the $20,000 that it will cost you to maintain an acre of non-native turf grass. Native plants promote biodiversity. And one of the biggest threats to wildlife, you know, birds, butterflies, and other wildlife is habitat loss. And in the United States, over 20 million acres of lawn exist covering more land than any other single crop in the country. So by planting natives, by using natives in our landscaping, we can promote that biodiversity and help link natural systems. Oftentimes you hear arguments against native plants. 
Some people claim they're unattractive, but they, in reality, there are many, many attractive trees, shrubs, and herbs. In the upper left-hand corner is a loblolly bay. This is a native to South Florida. And also we have an alligator lily, which is a wetland plant. Some claim that natives are slow growing and natives just like other plants vary widely in this regard, just as do exotic plants. In some cases, slow growth can be improved with water and fertilizer. Slow growth can also be advantageous. It will reduce the amount of pruning that you might have to do. Some people think that natives are difficult to propagate or grow, that they're expensive, that they're unavailable. And things are really changing, especially, you know, as um, public interest in native plants is increasing. We now have over 80 nurseries listed by the Association of Florida Native Plant Nurseries with a combined plant inventory of over 600 species. And even the big box stores these days uh, feature natives in many, many instances. We have a great wealth of native plants here in Florida that can be used in rural or urban home landscapes. Nearly half of the tree species in North America, north of Mexico occur here in Florida. So we have a wide variety to choose from, ranging from the spectacular Southern Magnolia to the vining Virginia creeper. As you travel around Florida, native trees are already well represented in South Florida nurseries. Some of the staples of Florida horticulture include things like sea grape, our state tree, which is the cab cabbage palm or sable palmetto, mahogany in South Florida is a, a Caribbean native, but it's also native to extreme South Florida and can be planted up to about Palm Beach County and Lee County on the east, on the west coast. Um, bald cypress, live oak, which is, you know, again, classic Southern tree, you know, reminiscent of the Old South, uh, the Southern Magnolia, Gumbo Limbo, which some people call the tourist tree because it peels, the bark peels, and just like somebody that's come down and gotten a bad sunburn. Um, Silver Buttonwood, another one, all very well represented in um, landscaping in South Florida. So natives really have a place in every landscape. They're particularly useful on sites where existing vegetation has be, been retained in public recreation areas and in environmentally sensitive sites, such as wetlands. We have different native vegetation ecosystems, ranging from pine flatwoods to hardwood hammocks to scrub wet and dry prairies, and again, we need to consider the size of our lot, where power lines are, you know, the location of buildings, and I'll get more into that. One of the first factors to consider is climate, hardening the zone. You know, even though Florida is relatively warm, we do have areas in the northern part of the state which can be quite cold in the winter months. Um, you know, this brown area. And this green area at the bottom is relatively frost free. Um, this midsection experiences a freeze or frost almost every year. So again, you need to choose the right, right plants for the hardiness zone where you're located. And oftentimes we have microclimates. So you may be able to cheat a little bit by planting certain sensitive plants in clumps with more resistant plants. Um, but overall, you wanna choose the right plant for the right, right place. Some species are very widely adapted. Others are very specialized in their requirement. Other factors to consider are soil type, the pH of the soil, the hydrology. Um, all of Florida at one time was much, pretty much a wetland. We've drained it extensively, but we still have wet areas. And in the summertime when we're having heavy rains, Oftentimes our water tables are within a few feet of the surface, which is detrimental to certain species, but we could plant 
species that um, tolerate wet conditions in those areas. In my own yard, I have an area where the downspouts from the roof run in and was always a boggy area. You know, I couldn't get grass to grow very well. And finally, I just gave up and made a little wetland, you know, and it's only a few hundred feet or square feet in size, but it's a wetland and it has wetland species such as cypress and this native pond apple and provides a little microcosm of a habitat even in my you know, yard. Other things that you want to consider when you're looking at natives, what are you looking for in, in the landscape? What functionality do you want? Are you looking for shade? Are you looking for color? Do you want a barrier? Maybe, um, you know, you have a highway or a roadway nearby and you want to put up a barrier to block some of that noise. Are we looking for ground covers? Uh, how much maintenance are we willing to put in? Consider the mature size and shape of the plant. Oftentimes landscapers and gardeners, you know, homeowners as well, you know, don't think how big is that plant going to get? And they plant a, you know, tree that matures at a very large size within a few feet of the foundation of the house or under a power line. And a few years later, now we have a problem and to remove a you know, fairly good sized tree can get fairly expensive. So again, think about the mature size, think about the plant requirements. Planting natives is not really very different than planting other exotic, than planting exotic landscape materials. Um, if we're planting shrubs or trees, we want to take out the sod. Um, I've always heard it, you know, said that you want to, you know, it's better to have a hundred dollar hole for a ten dollar tree than a hundred dollar tree for a ten dollar hole. Um, you want to be able, you know, make a nice planting um, environment for that tree so the roots can establish well. You want to think about establishment. Many natives do not require irrigation once established, but until they do, you're going to have to provide some irrigation to get them started until they're well rooted into the ground. Um, mulch is often beneficial to help reduce the amount of irrigation to hold the water, um, you know, prevent evapotranspiration, and also to prevent weed growth around the trees. Again, here in Florida, our soils are very sandy, they're infertile. So even with natives, a slow release fertilizer um, such as a palm or azalea xora fertilizer can help get them off to a good start. Um, all plants require some maintenance, um, you know, some amount of pruning, especially for trees to make sure that um, we maintain a single leader and we don't have branching, which could become dangerous as that tree grows later on in windstorms and events like that. We have a wide range of species to choose from. I'm not going to read all of these, but you know, a number of large trees ranging from live oak to southern red cedar, and a bunch of things in between that are native here to South Flo or to Florida. Number of small trees. This is a dahoon holly, has a red berry um, around this time of year. We have persimmon, the loblolly bay, which I showed earlier. Uh, Sweet Bay Magnolia, I made this presentation a few years ago. I would not recommend at this time planting Red Bay. Red Bay is a native, but recently in the last five years, we've had an ambrosia beetle, which has begun invading all of Florida, spreading a disease caused the, called the um, laurel wilt and red bay is in the laurel family as, far, as is avocado, and it's wiping out these plants statewide. So I'd avoid that one. Needle palm, pop ash, or a few others. We have a number of shrubs. Um, this is button bush, but we have fire bush. Um, wild coffee is widely used in South Florida. Um, wax myrtle, a number of these are very good, often used in landscapes number of wildflowers that can be incorporated into your landscape. 
And if you're interested in complete lists, the University of Florida, and I'll talk about this later, has guides to native plants ranging from trees to shrubs to gr ground covers and, you know, goes over the different merits, um, you know, the soil requirements, the environmental requirements of all these plants that you could look this up. Number of vines that, again, may be helpful in attracting butterflies and birds. Number of grasses and can be incorporated as well. Also ferns, we have a wide variety of ferns. And ferns are particularly useful in that they often can survive under the dense shade of, of trees, whereas grass doesn't do too well there. Um, as I say, we have a lot of wetland areas, even in a gated type community, oftentimes there is a water feature because most of the places in South Florida, they dig the fill out from a low lying area to build up the land on which they build houses, resulting in some sort of water feature in the community. And there's a number of plants that can be used there. And these also provide environmental benefits in that they act as filters to remove some of the nutrients which could cause algal blooms in those water features if we just leave them basically bare with sod or grass growing right to the edge of the water. So again, the choice is really yours. You can go all the way and go completely native, or you can integrate plantings with your, you know, conventional exotic type, you know, crotons and other um, popular landscape plants. So again, there's a lot of ways to go with using natives. And no one way is right, no one way is wrong. I will point out under Florida law that our native plants are protected. So you just can't go out in the woods and dig up plants and bring them home. It is against the law to destroy, injure, harvest, collect, or pick any plant covered by law without permission of the landowner. And this has become a problem in recent years and our authorities, including Fish and Wildlife Commission have been cracking down on these practices because natives have become so popular. Not every native is nice. Some are a little less desirable than others. Uh, we have things like poison ivy, duckweed, which can cover the entire surface of water bodies. Um, wild grape, which if controlled properly is a great plant to attract wildlife. It can be quite invasive and cover over trees and shrubs. Um, and become get out of hand in some instances. So again, the whole idea of using natives is to provide a place for our native wildlife, our birds, our butterflies, and others, depending on where you are. And again, Florida is rapidly developing, so the more that we can do on a microcosm in our individual landscapes, um, it's going to benefit our native species. And it doesn't mean that you have to eliminate your entire lawn. You might just take a corner of your yard and do something like this, let it go a little wild. If we're looking at landscaping for wildlife, all animals need certain things. They all need food, cover, water, and space. And this is what we call habitat. Um, so if we can provide some or all of these requirements, it's going to help attract animals, birds to our landscape. Your yard can serve as a breeding site, a wintering site, stopover site, and different species may appear in your yard at different times of the year. To provide habitat for birds, again, we want to think about food, we want to think about shelter, um, think about water and cover. Um, many birds are preyed on by other birds like hawks, so they need some thicker areas where they could get in there and hide. They need food. Food, depending on the type of bird that we're trying to attract, maybe berries and fruits that are produced by native plants. They may be insects that feed on native plants. Um, we can tide them over by providing seed. And larger birds 
such as hawks and owls are meat eaters. So by creating a habitat that attracts things like squirrels, we may end up attracting owls and, and hawks to our landscape as well. Again, by planting flowers and flowering plants, we can attract insects and these insects will go on and plant, attract birds. Many different types of birds are insectivorous, meaning they require insects in their diet. Here's a sample of several of those uh, ranging from wood, various types of woodpeckers to uh, warblers to great crested flycatcher. So insect habitat is gonna be bird habitat. How can we you know, provide a habitat for insects? By planting natives, by saving dead trees or what we call snags, by reducing pesticide use. Um, if we indiscriminately use pesticides, we're gonna wipe out insects. And, hey, excuse me. Excuse me. Um, we can spot treat, you know, instead of broadcast spraying our entire yard, we can use alternative methods of insect control. Another thing that we can do is to reduce the amount of mowed lawn by creating islands of wild areas. Insects become relatively scarce during the colder months. So to provide um, food to over winter, even though we don't have severe winters in Florida, we can stock a wire cage with peanut butter or suet, which provides an alternative food for these insectivorous birds. Um, we can provide seed as well, either by planting wild species or native species, such as the sweet gum, whose seeds are used by a wild, wide variety of birds or by providing feeders with seed as well. As well. And again, a number of different species are seed eaters, things like your house finch, number of different types of sparrows, blue jays, all attracted to various forms of fruit and seeds. Um, different types of feeders out there. Some of your smaller birds, um, are quite timid and oftentimes they will be out competed on these open type of hanging feeders or platform feeders. So um, for some, these feeders that exclude larger birds and some of them come with a cage that hangs around this feeder, feeder tube um, are conducive to some of those smaller like painted buntings and indigo buntings and things like that. Many native species produce fruits, things like hollies, the Yalpoon holly that I showed you earlier, cedar trees, um, beauty berries, wax myrtle, um, all provide fruits that um, will attract birds. Nectar, if we wanna attract hummingbirds, um, species with red tubular flowers like this trumpet vine, we can also provide a hummingbird feeder I will warn you if you're located in South Florida, the only hummingbird that we have in South Florida is the ruby-throated hummingbird, and it's a migrant. You will see them for a few weeks in the spring and a few weeks in the fall. If you get up to the northern part of the state, they're a summer resident, and they'll be there from you know, late April to late or to early October. They will be there all summer, but don't think if you're in South Florida that you're gonna have a year round population of hummingbirds because it really doesn't happen. Again, some of the birds that are attracted to nectar and fruits are cedar waxwing, mockingbird, brown thrasher. Again, by creating habitat that attracts things like frogs, squirrels, or other smaller birds, we may attract things like hawks and owls. Cover is really important. You know, just like every other wild creature, something, many things prey on birds, including feral cats. 
So if we can provide some thicker areas where they can find shelter, this is going to help attract birds to our landscape as well. Many species of birds require cavities as nesting areas and they're often sh in short supply. So again, you know, if it's feasible, if you could leave dead trees alone, um, if they're located well away from your house where they don't cause a hazard, you know, if a windstorm causes it to topple, um, can provide habitats for birds. Alternatively, we can provide um, nesting boxes. All of these are those that require or cavities for nesting. So again, you could leave snags or provide nesting boxes. Also want to think about vertical den height density. So, you know, trees with some lower growing shrubs and trees with some ground cover or grasses underneath, again, creates that diversity, which will attract birds and other wildlife to our landscaping. Think about stopping mowing or reducing mowing in some areas of your yard. If we could provide water. Again, we have a lot of water at some times of the year, but sometimes of the year in Florida in our dry season, we can go literally months without a drop of rain. And these, like all other animals, require a source of water. We can provide water through bird baths, a running water feature, um, a pond. And they don't have to be big, they can be quite small in size. Again, think about your space, think about what you can do to that space to you know, provide habitat. And so again, different birds are gonna make decisions at different scales. If we wanna to try to attract larger birds, we're gonna to need to think in a more global, you know, neighborhood wide type uh, scenario, but smaller birds, oftentimes their territory can be for things like a, a Carolina wren, their territory can be as little as a quarter acre. So your yard may provide the ideal habitat for some of these smaller birds. So again, be aware of habitats surrounding your property. Again, if you are you know, located against a wild area, maybe you can increase the scope of that wild area by taking a portion of your property that borders that um, area where native plants are, are growing. Think about the size of the bird, um, maybe work with your neighbors. You know, If you leave a little side of your yard um, plant or plant the side of your yard and neighbors and your neighbors and your neighbors do the same thing. You can collectively, you know, between four of you, maybe the corner, you know, the, that you all share. If you can all do something in that corner, again, you can create a, you know, bigger habitat without, without sacrificing a great deal of your yard. Um, again, be willing to experiment and nothing is certain. So embrace an uncertainty and try some different things and see what works and what doesn't work. So again, in summary, birds require a couple or, you know, bird habitat consists of food, water, cover and space. Think about the life stages. Um, they're gonna need breeding areas, nesting boxes or cavities for those that do that. Others, you know, will nest in shrubs and trees. So they require that you have adequate amounts of shrubs or trees and food. Cover, again, is that vertical height diversity, you know, with, you know, tall growing plants with uh, shrubs and lower growing plants underneath, running water, and again, maybe work with your neighbors. Talk a little bit about butterflies. And again, just like with birds and other wildlife, you need to provide proper habitat. You need to be aware of the life history of butterflies. The larvae require very specific foodstuffs in most instances. So if you're gonna attract butterflies, you need to provide 
to larval host plants. The adult butterfly feeds on nectar, which is produced in flowers. So you can attract adults by providing nectar plants, but you're gonna do a better job if you have a combination of nectar plants and larval host plants at the same time. And again, these host plants must be tailored to specific butterflies, things like monarchs and gulf fritillaries. Um, use milkweed primarily as a host plant. And unless you have milkweed, you're not gonna get these. And there are non-native milkweeds or are native milkweeds here in Florida. Some plants are host to a variety of different butterflies like your passion vine. They attract the gulf fritillary, the zebra longwing, some are very, very specific. The pipe wing swallowtail feeds only on a plant called a Dutchman's pipe. One easy way to provide larval food is stop mowing certain areas of your yards. Some of the native wildflowers will spring up and provide larval food. Um, there's a very common butterfly in South Florida called a peacock. And the larval food for that one is what some people consider a weed called frog bit that grows in most turf areas if we don't apply an herbicide. Um, if you do plant a garden, don't forget those larval host plants. And flowering plants provide food for adult butterflies. Um, you can also provide additional food for adult butterflies um, by placing out bits of rotting fruit, things like oranges, apples, and bananas will attract a number of different types of adult butterflies. Just like with birds, we wanna think about height diversity have some cover because again, butterflies are preyed on by birds and other <clears throat> wildlife. So they need places to hide and they're gonna benefit from these natural areas. Um, again, depending on the size of your yard and you know, the, your tolerance, you know, some of the trimmings and things that you prune when you're trimming, if you pile them up, in a discreet area at the back of your yard and make a small brush pile that again can provide habitat shelter <clears throat> for butterflies. Excuse me. <clears throat> butterflies are <clears throat> excuse me, are solar creatures. Um, being insects, they're cold blooded, so they need sunny areas, basking areas, where especially on cool mornings and colder days like we're experiencing the last few weeks, they can get out and sun themselves and bring themselves up to a temperature that allows them to become active. Um, so by providing a combination of you know, shaded sheltered areas with sunny areas, placing flat stones in those sunny areas where the butterflies can alight and warm themselves um, is gonna help attract them to your property. Butterflies, just like other animals require water. Um, and they typically rely on what we call puddling areas. And this could be something as small as the ceramic base that you would put under a flower pot um, filled with sand and then keep that damp and the butterflies will come down. They'll insert their proboscis and extract the moisture that they need. They also require minerals and these puddling areas provide them with a source of minerals, especially sodium. Remember that butterflies are insects. And many of the pesticides that we use are nonspecific and they're gonna kill both pest insects and butterflies. So again, you wanna reduce pesticide area, uh, pesticide usage. And if you must treat, you know, if you have a, a bush or a shrub or, you know, 
garden area that's coming under attack, spot treat those areas and, you know, spray only those areas that you must must spray or you know is essential to spray with an insecticide. Think about other ways of controlling. We have many products such as insecticidal soaps, oils that are relatively non-toxic to most insects unless they're put directly on the insect. Um, so they can be some alternatives as well. Think again about space. You want to group your flowers and host plants together in patches. Um, make sure you have some sunny areas, some puddling areas, and some woody areas for cover. And think about you know your surroundings. Maybe you have a natural area near your property. You could expand that again onto your property. And by doing or you know, creating a landscape that attracts butterflies, you'll also be attracting a whole host of insect pollinators. And these pollinators are also important for not only the production of fruit and vegetables, but around the country, pollinators are under fire. Their habitat is rapidly being lost and it's actually becoming you know, a critical concern in many areas of the country is the reduction in native pollinators that are out there. So again, in summary, we want to provide food for butterflies. That includes flowering plants for adults and host plants for caterpillars, cover, dense vegetation or a brush pile, basking and puddling areas, and we want to reduce pesticide use. We want to try to group plants together and think about what's around you. There's a lot of information out there. Um, the Florida Butterfly Gardening Guide is an excellent resource. Um, it's available through the University of Florida Press. I'm sure you could find it on Amazon and elsewhere. Um, our West Florida <coughs> Education Center also has a, a lot of information out there. In terms of design, um, you want to think about what you're doing and you know move gradually from you know, a, a conventional type landscape to a, maybe a more native landscape. You want to get to know your property, you know, what, you know, observe, look, look and see, do you have shady areas? Do you have wet areas? Do you have high traffic areas? What existing plants do you have? Um, you want to maintain views, um, you know, roadway or other features. Um, think about topography. You want to sketch, it helps to sketch and draw up a plan on paper. Um, sketch your site out, draw the property lines, you know, put the house and the driveway, other, you know, fences and other structures on that plan. Um, if you have water or, or wet areas, you know, where is it? Where does it go? Um, you have good views or unsightly views, you know, unsightly views are those that you might want to get rid of by planning more dense plantings, what type of soil, um, you know, do you have high ground or low ground? And again, check off what you, desired uses you're looking for. You know, obviously we probably, most of us are gonna wanna maintain some functional areas for humans, you know, some open areas where we can have picnics or, you know, children can play outside and provide functional areas at the same time for wildlife along the perimeter of these areas that we're preserving for human use. So again, create a diagram, uh, draw out your future landscape, and then slowly but surely start pursuing that dream. So again, there's a lot of information out there. The University of Florida has a web, website that we call EDIS or Electronic um, Information system. Um, all of our publications are available at this website, edis.ifis.ufl.edu. Other great resources are your local county extension office. Most every county in the state of Florida has a master gardener group, and these are volunteers that can provide you a lot of good information on what works well in your area. Um, 
check out the Association of Florida Plant Nurseries. They have a website and will direct you to where you can buy plants in your local area. <clears throat> I also already mentioned the University of Florida. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, website Native Plants of South Florida, the Florida Native Plant Society are all great resources. Number of books are out there. Um, Florida Native Plants, Florida Wildflowers and Native Communities. Um, many, many great books out there. And again, most of these are available through the University of Florida Press. And with that, I thank you for inviting me today. I hope I was able to provide some useful information to you and willing to take your questions at this time. Thank you so much, Gene. That was excellent. We have several questions and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so the first one is from Chris. How do you manage keeping milkweed without the caterpillars decimating it to the degree the left to hatch can starve? That can be problematic, if, especially if you have just a, a few plantings. Um, you really can't unless you're going to be a little ruthless and reduce the number of caterpillars that, you know, just like a farmer with a, a pasture, you can't put a hundred cows in a two acre pasture. And the same is true with your milkweed. It's going to support so many animals, you know, those animals being caterpillars. So either, you know, probably the easiest way is to take out some of the eggs before they hatch out or remove some of the caterpillars and relocate them to a neighbor or somebody else interested in raising them that might have adequate supplies of milkweed. Lovely, thank you. Um, okay, so this is from Rob and Anne-Marie. We have two questions about vegetables. Um, so this is Rob's first year in South Florida after relocating from central um, New Jersey. Welcome. Um, so these two folks, they, they kind of want to know when to start planting tomatoes, peas, um, since we have such an expanded season here and, and, and um, would love advice in the soil. The soil needs something um, yes. and, and beans. Do you have any suggestions on timing and things like that? Yes, very much. You know, again, we're kind of backwards here in Florida. We start planting our gardens when everybody else in the country is finishing up. So typically for your warm season vegetables like tomatoes and green beans, peppers, eggplants, we'll start planting in late August, September. And then as the weather starts to cool down at the end of October, early November, we'll start transitioning from those types of plants to things like lettuce and cabbage, broccoli that are cool season vegetables. Peas, they're all cool season. We have a great, um, called the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide that you can find at the EDIS website that I mentioned earlier. Um, it provides seasons depending on where you are in the state, provides suggestions for varieties and things like that. So there's a lot of good information out there. Again, your local extension office can help you out. Um, as far as soils, our soils are lousy. You know, I used to, when I was in extension, I would get farmers coming from other parts of the country and tell me they were looking to relocate in South Florida. Could I tell them where they could find some good dirt, quote unquote? And I would look at them and say, nowhere in Florida. Are, you know, basically we're trying to grow things on beach sand here. So the secret to doing that is a lot of organic matter, compost, as much compost as you could put into your soil is going to build up that soil, increase the water holding capacity, increase the nutrient holding capacity, and you have to use fertilizer of some sort, be it organic or um, chemical fertilizers. But um, otherwise, Growing vegetables in South Florida is almost like growing hydroponically. The only thing that the soil does is hold the plant up and you have to provide all the water and nutrients required. Interesting, thank you. 
Um, and we have another one from Anne Marie. Are there some native plants easy to propagate using cuttings? Or do you have any suggestions? Um, <laughs> a number of them can. And again, it depends on the, you know, a lot of the herbaceous, um, you know, butterfly plants can easily be, pro things like milkweed easily propagated from cuttings, passion vine easily propagated from cutting. Um, some of your hardwood species can be propagated from cuttings, but they're a little more difficult to propagate that way. So again, there are guides out there that, you know, I could help you access um, and feel free, I'll give you my email address. Um, feel free to reach out or reach out to your local extension office and they could help you with, you know, more specific information. Awesome. Um, we have Nancy, she says, hello from Sanibel. Um, she grows Rutgers tomatoes um, and they don't get um, as big, but are tasty. Container gardening. Um, thank you. I think I'm doing all the right things on my three and four acre. Um, no lawn, mostly native plants, water for animals, an owl box, and I do use your website often. Great. Um, and let's see. So you showed persimmons on your small tree list. Is this the Fuju persimmon? Is, is it easy to grow in Jacksonville, Florida area? Um, no, this the, the persimmon I was referring to, Fuju is a Japanese variety. Um, we have a native persimmon and the persimmons don't get very big. They get the size of maybe a, a small plum. Um, they are edible. They're not as desirable as some of the cultivated varieties of persimmons, but they do attract a variety of wildlife. And when the fruits fall to the ground, um, they provide uh, traction for butterflies as well. Um, we got a couple more questions, if that's okay. Uh, around August, I get webworm moths in droves, and I do use pesticides to kill them, and I'm sure this hurts my monarchs. Do you have any suggestions? Again, you know, be discreet in the way you use those pesticides. Um, things like BT might be a possible solution, although BT also um, will affect caterpillars, butterfly larvae. Um, you know, sometimes by creating a habitat that attracts birds, uh, if you can attract more insectivorous birds to your area, they may feed on and suppress those populations when they become, you know, uh, when they start to expand. But again, everything's in balance and sometimes we have to, you know, Pesticides become necessary to protect other things. Okay. Um, we've got a couple of questions from Bev. Uh, she has an area near um, a wet area beyond her yard. She has decided to remove the St. Augustine grass in a big area um, near that wet area. And she usually amends soil when planting. And she usually adds black cow and topsoil and dig it in for planting of wildflowers and natives. She asks, what do you think? What do I think? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great strategy. Um, there are a number of things like duck potato and uh, pickerel weed and um, blue flag iris that are you know, natives that will grow well in those wetter areas. There are some shrubby uh, species like uh, buttonwood or button bush that I showed the picture of earlier. Um, depending where you are in the state, your Loblolly Bay will uh, do well in wetter areas. So there's a wide variety of things that can be planted there and create a more natural uh, situation or landscape in that area and not try to fight um, to maintain a, a you know, St. Augustine grass that's not really gonna be happy in that wet area. Um, so this past year, she had these black and red bugs eating the tender parts of her milkweed. Do you have any recommendations? Those are milkweed bugs. They also share the same taste for milkweed. Um, you know, you can discourage them with a strong spray of soapy water directed 
on the bug itself, um, knock them off to the ground. And soap, believe it or not, is a very um, efficacious insecticide if it's placed directly on the insect itself. So again, it, a lot of it's gonna require placement by using your sprayer and dialing that nozzle so it produces a stream and spraying it right on those bugs. You can you know, knock them off and um, it's gonna help or you can use physical methods and that means you know, getting a gardening glove on and squishing them. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so one more question from her. Um, the birdhouse that you uh, showed on a short post, what bird was that for? Bluebirds um, will, you know, pretty much on about a five to six foot post. Also, great crested flycatchers will go in houses like that. Um, I've put up a number of bluebird houses on my property. And I don't get many bluebirds, but I get a lot of great crested flycatchers and a lot of um, redheaded woodpeckers um, will come into those as well. The woodpeckers typically open up the hole a little bigger and allow themselves in, and then the flycatchers come in as well. Awesome. Um, and just one last question. Thank you for sharing your email uh, or offering your email. Um, and would you be willing to also share um, your slides. Sure. Awesome. I actually have one more question. We have one minute left, so I can squeeze it in from John. He says, I'm a colleague of yours from back in the day at Rutgers Horticulture Department. I don't remember if we had any classes together, but your brother Rich and I both worked under Harry James, and he's glad to see you. Okay, great. So I'll let him know we uh, saw each other virtually. Excellent. Um, and I think that is the last of the questions. Thank you so much, Jean. This was wonderful. I learned a lot myself um, that I will be putting to use in my own yard. Um, and I hope everyone enjoyed it. And I, I know they did. Um, and stay tuned for more events from Rutgers Alumni. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation.